So I might as well just leave this on here. Hey, it'll keep you focused on what you're looking for. Hey, look at that guy. He's a little nuts. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through Christ Jesus, his Son, our Lord, who is the only resurrection of the life. Amen. So these people, and because of some type, some spell check things that you read that was run through, instead of Cappadocia, these people came from Cappuccino. <laughs> and from instead of from Pontus, they came from Pontoons. You gotta love Microsoft spell check, don't you? <laughs> instead of Coeternal, co uh, they came up, I don't know what they came up with. So, interesting thing is, when you use the spell check, get used to tag ad vocabulary, ad vocabulary, when you do, whenever you're doing anything religious. Well, I mentioned with the kids here, Peter had to go outside when they started speaking in foreign languages. Now, this isn't the tongues that you see in the charismatic churches where they're babbling and no one can understand. And even St. Paul mentions, what good is that unless you have someone who can interpret? That's a whole different thing that came ever later that's called glossolalia. But the gift that came upon the apostles was the purpose of what? To be able to communicate to the people to whom they were supposed to go. Remember what was told to them? Remain in Jerusalem until you receive power on on high. Then beginning in Jerusalem, go out into Judea and then Samaria and then to the very ends of the earth, proclaiming everything that I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, Thomas, doubting Thomas, was given the gift of speaking probably Hindi because it's known that he is went to India. And to this day, there is still called a church, Markoma, means St. Thomas Church. St. Andrew went to Spain. All of them, eventually, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 73 AD, they finally scattered. But they didn't move fast enough. They sat on their hands in Jerusalem for another 20 years after receiving the Holy Spirit. Well, actually, more like 30. So in the interim, what did God have to do? Since these people aren't moving, I'm going to get another one. And he got St. Paul into the action. And he became the apostle to the Gentiles. That's you and me. People who are not part of the original covenant. So this very strange gift was a miraculous gift that everyone, if we had, there'd be so much less problems in the world. Married guys, yeah, like you, back at you. What does it mean when your wife says, fine? <laughs> it can mean any of a number of things, right? But usually, it does not mean fine. Especially after you've been discussing it for a while, and she gets tight lipped and goes, fun. And then looks off into the distance, realizing you're going to pay for this later. <laughs> and you, you agree that you've done that to your husband? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> that's, and that's near at home with our own families. Think of what goes on when you have religion, I should say, tongues, speech, so very different. How different is English from Russian? Completely different roots. Completely different grammar. You think there's ever been true understanding between the two languages? Someone back in the late 60s, I'm sure they've improved it since then, tried to come up with a computer program that would co convert from one language to the other. But then they started trying to work with idioms, idiomatic speech that we have in English. Out of mind, I mean, out of sight, out of mind, right? It means what? If you don't see it for long enough, you forget about it. You translated that into Russian, it came out blind and insane. <laughs> That's not quite what was intended, right? 
Idioms do not go from language to language very well, and yet we use them so very often. What kind of shortcuts do you take in speech? Think of those things. And foreigners, when they try and understand what on earth we are talking about, because they've been taught the Queen's English. They're still speaking Victorian English from way back when. Very stiff and stilted. And when they're confronted with the Americans, the way we speak, it's one. It's even worse when they actually speak to the original British with their strange, oh my goodness, the way that they've changed the language. There's so much slang. You know, I mean, here in the United States, if you hear the word shag, you think of carpeting and nice and thick. In British, it's not polite company at all. Just have to watch Austin Powers, you know that one. What other things? You're going in the lift. What? Elevator? No, elevators are the things that you put on your legs to hold up your socks. No, 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 no. Elevators are what you think you need to go to the next floor. But then you go to the second story, and they take you to the third because the first one is ground, not earth. <laughs> See how confused we can get even when we're speaking supposedly the same language? Yet, God saw that when we were speaking the same language, what happened? We got into trouble because we tried to what? Climb the stairway to heaven? Yeah. Doesn't work, does it? No. They tried to build the tower and they didn't use, it's strange that they said they used fire, brick, okay, that's fine, and bitumen, which is asphalt. Probably not the best kind of mortar. But God, they built it pretty high and God said, look what they're trying to do. They're trying to come up here. I'm going to stop that. But instead of just kicking down the tower, what did he do to them? He confused their tongue so they could not cooperate. And that's our problem in our world today. Because St. Paul made it quite clear, he said, it is better to speak ten words in a clear tongue than to speak a thousand words in the speaking of tongues. And the clear words have to be in the language of the people to whom you're speaking. And think of how many centuries went by until that happened. In all of Europe, people were going to Mass, and they were just standing there, and the Mass was going on in Latin, and they were just screwing their thumbs, and they had to introduce the beetle. He was the guy who clanged the little bell when the priest said, Hocus corpus meum, so they knew that it was the Lord's Supper, because they couldn't understand the words. But who fixed that? And he was accused of sacrilege and blasphemy for doing it our very own Martin Luther. He made the Deutsche Messe, the German Mass. He had it in the German language. And because the people were so ignorant of what was going on in the service, he replaced most of the liturgical parts with new songs that he had written. And while it's not true that he tuned all of them to beer songs, and there was at least one that he did do that to. Because the people found were known quite well. Well, have you ever had a tune running through your head and you just can't forget it because you can't remember the title or who did it? But somehow the, the tune is in your head and won't go away? That's how it is with the music of the church. People remember the songs better than they remember the prose. When someone speaks to you, can someone go one ear, not the other? However, if I start, hot dogs, armor, hot dogs, you know the rest of it? What kind of is, yes, you see, you remember that when you Oh, I wish I were a, see? Tunes stick with you. And so Martin Luther, created the first German hymnal with 37 hymns, and it was those same 37 hymns that he sang week after week after week, and each hymn had like 40 verses. And they remembered them, because it taught the basics of the Christian faith all the way through. That 
was the art of Martin Luther. To get people to learn the scriptures in a way that they would never suspect. By singing songs about drinking beer. Or that came from songs about drinking beer. Using their tunes. And that wasn't uncommon. I mean, because Martin Luther himself complained. The very first parish that he was at, he says, the people here do nothing except grow barley, turn it into beer, and drink it. That's their whole life. Yeah, and Tom says, that sounds good to me. <laughs> and that's part of the whole German thing that was going on. And, and what was it? Is it a big deal? No. The music? Yeah. And even, even he called it liquid bread. And he said that so many people here over drink, and yet what was his usual practice? After dinner, he would sit at the table with his students and his friends, and he would drink three great big steins of warm beer. Each stein held about a quart and a half. And that was considered moderate drinking to the Germans. Now the reason I mention all of this is why? Because cultures change, but the doctrines of the church do not. They never change the message. It's just how it's presented. If I speak in the tongues of men and the angels, but I do not have love, then I have become a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Remember hearing that from St. Paul? You can speak to people, but if not from the love of your heart, it's meaningless. If I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith, so that I can move mountains, but I do not have love, then I am nothing. Love never fails. And the thing about this whole passage, this whole chapter in 1 Corinthians is you could replace the word love with the name Jesus and it would make perfectly good sense. If I have faith that can move mountains but I do not have Jesus, then it is nothing. Make sense? Yeah. Jesus never fails. Make sense? You betcha. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And we know that these things, these things abide. Faith, hope, and love, which you can call Jesus. These are the greatest. And the greatest of all is love. That is, Jesus. Now there are greater gifts that come from God that we see very rarely, but that's because we don't read things like the Ecclesiasticus, it's an extra book, it's in the Apocrypha. My son, when you are sick, repent of your sins, take your offering to the priest, then go see the doctor, because that's why God created doctors. That's actually what it says in there. God gave us these gifts so that we could take advantage of them and use them wisely. God doesn't necessarily want us to always have miraculous cures all the time, but to depend upon what? One another for what? Everything that we need in life. Like if we want a nice casserole, how many ladies here can make really nice casseroles? Mm, no, yes, yes, no. Or, or if you're in Wisconsin, I guess you call it hot dish. Yeah, one of those things. How many can make good pasties? I love pasties, but you don't, you don't make them around here. All these things are gifts. How many of you are hospitable? And you will have people, have a guest room for people to stay when they're traveling through. These days, with a stranger off the street, that can be dangerous. But once upon a time, that was a thing to do. And I remember one lady. Growing up in the Depression years, you know, she said, one chicken, her mother made it last for two, two meals, major ones. First day she would boil it to get out all the fat and make soup. The next day she would roast it and it would get to the family. And the dad always got the, huge, the, the largest portion because he was the one who worked for a living and brought, home for, brought money home for the rest of the family. 
And yet, she said, anytime a hobo came by the back door, she always managed to put together a couple of sandwiches for him to go, somehow. And yet, she said, we often had to have lard on bread with a little salt. You can live on it, but you probably wouldn't want to live on it a lot, you know. That's the gift of generosity and hospitality in a time of great need, when you realize that there are people who are soft than you are. And all of these things, all of them come from what? Having the gift of the Holy Spirit, having descended into your heart and made you different from the rest of the world, a child of God, so that you have the gifts of the Spirit, generosity, kindness, mercy, patience, long-suffering, a little different from patience, and, and all these others. Able to do what? To do things in this world that are unexpected. Yesterday I went to a Jimmy John's drive-thru. Yes, I got one of those expensive sandwiches. The guy gave me too much in change and knocked on the glass. Here, he gave me a dollar too much. He just sort of looked at me and took it. He didn't even say thank you. I think he was just sort of shocked, or, or maybe he was either annoyed that I caught him in a mistake. I don't know. But nevertheless, how many people do that? I only do it because I like to pat myself on the back and, hey, I gave him back a dollar. But you do that in the grocery store when they give you to that change? Sometimes you don't even think about it. You just stick it in your wallet or your pocket. It's one of those things, you know, I've done that. You don't know if you've been shortchanged or given too much, but somehow somebody's place screwed up. Nevertheless, is that a way the world would work? Oh, look, I got extra. I'm going to be quiet about that one. That's the way the world would do it. And yet you're not like that, are you? If you realize someone had made a mistake and it's going to come out of their pay because when they do the cash register count, the, or the X register, that it's going to be counted against them because it's short. You don't want to hurt someone to hurt innocently. Because you are a child of God and you want to do what is right for that person. So if we can speak five words, let alone not, not maybe ten, that a way that is understood that shares the love of Jesus Christ with someone else, then we have done the work of the Holy Spirit. You do not have to be a great evangelist. You do not have to be able to preach like Peter or Paul. You can always be like in the children's song, you can be like Aaron and hold up the prophet's arm with the staff. Moses got tired, you know, because they had 500,000 Hebrews crossing the Red Sea. After a while, I don't know, get a little tired of this. So what did Aaron do? He propped them up. Isn't that anything that any of us can do? To help in the holy ministry that way? To assist those who are in the office? Yeah. Because it's a good thing to do. But what about this tongues business? Let's forget about it. Let's worry about the more important things. Let's not worry about trying to build ourselves up, but concern ourselves with the gifts that build others up, and then lift them up so that we know exactly what God has said to us to do. To teach them everything that I have taught you, and the simplest and most basic ones of these is what? To love just as I have loved you. And having received the Holy Spirit through holy baptism, or perhaps having received the Holy Spirit first by the hearing of the word and confirmed in holy baptism, you are able to do these things. Do not question whether or not you're one of God's people. Just do it. And be what? A child of God in this world. And proclaim the mysteries of God's love by showing His love. And may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding fill our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
Amen.